Trump is by far the weirdest story I've ever covered. I've never covered a story so weird. And I've never covered a, a story where my sources, you know, all of them just, nobody wants to talk about it. And I'll tell you why this is a weird story. If you'll notice, I didn't call this story fake news last night. All right, if you'll notice, last night I was really quiet about the story, and there was a reason for that. My role has shifted from a kind of propagandist to a journalist, right? Now, I know that with the left, they're all propagandists. None of them are real journalists. Well, they're like 10. So I just can't run and call every story fake because if I run and call every story fake, then when I have really big news, nobody's really going to believe me, right? Nobody will believe me when I break big news, so I can't do that anymore. A year ago, I would have just said, WAPO, fake news. Can you believe it? That's, that's my role, but my role has changed, so I have to tell the full story. I never lied before. I've never lied or fabricated facts, but I would – sort of throw out rhetorical talking points without giving a lot of thought to the veracity, right? So I would just say the WAPO story is fake. So let's get into it because <clears throat> this is a weird story. Either the WAPO story is the biggest story of the year or it is the biggest fake news story of the year. I'll say that again. This is either the biggest story of the year or it is the biggest hoax of the year. It's a hoax at the, at the level of the Rolling Stone rape hoax from last year. Now, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why this is true. This has not been previously reported by anybody. <clears throat> this hasn't been previously reported by anybody. Hit the like button if you want the real scoop on this. If you're on, if you're on um, right now on YouTube watching, hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. If you're here, hit the like button. So what I'm about to say is not to shade Trump because this is true of every president, right? So I'm not insulting Trump or saying he isn't a good president or anything, all right? But the kind of intelligence information that Trump allegedly leaked, he didn't have. I'll tell you why that's important. The kind of information Trump was alleged to have leaked to Russians, he didn't have. So what my sources have told me is that the information is compartmentalized and it's a need-to-know basis. So it is a, it is a need, to know, need to know basis only. And Trump didn't have all the information. If the president says it's not classified, okay, you're blocked for a really stupid point. The president, we all know the president can say whatever he wants to say. That isn't the point. Trump didn't have the information they claimed he had, right? So what Trump talked about in that meeting with Russia where there were only five people, who were the five people in the room? Who are the five people in the room? Trump? Who else? Who else was in the room? Trump? Who else was in the room? So Trump in that meeting had talked about the laptop threat, which was public knowledge. Remember when Paul Joseph Watson and other people were saying that they were annoyed that if they flew, flew over from the UK, they wouldn't be able to have a laptop on their flight, right? That was, so that was the story. What Trump talked about in the meeting was about the laptop threat and how ISIS had found a way to turn laptops into bombs. That was all he said. That was all he said. Now, that laptop threat had been discovered by a certain mission, and I can't even go into any of this stuff. It was, it was uncovered by a certain mission, a joint operation with various – I'm not going to tell you who because that's going to expose my sources, right? Trump didn't have that information. Trump didn't know where they learned about the laptop threat because as multiple people told me, they said this is a need to know basis and no president needs to know it. Now, if Trump wants that information, they have to give it to him, right? So if Trump had said, I want to know this information, I'm ordering you to tell me, they're going to tell him. But it's all need to know. So the president doesn't need to know every little detail about every little military operation, right? And I said, well, wait a minute, is that like a criticism of Trump? And they all said, no, actually, no, no president. And many of my sources were in the Obama administration, too. So, you know, a lot of my sources are actually Democrats who don't like the warmongering with masters. So that would be, you know, a, a thing maybe a lot of people don't know is not every Democrat supports the warmongering 
of McMaster and Petraeus and other types. So many of my sources were, you know, were liberals too. So the issue is that they go, no president would have the level of detail that they're claiming in the Washington Post and the New York Times. And now I'll tell you why everybody is shook up. Now I'll tell you the real reason everybody is shook. Whoever leaked that story to the Washington Post leaked more information than Trump talked about. I'm going to pause that for a minute, right? I'm going to, I'm going to pause that for a minute. The person who leaked that story to the Washington Post leaked more information than Trump had actually talking about, had actually talked about, right? That is the real story here. Our national security has now been completely jeopardized by the leaker. Trump didn't say anything that wasn't already public knowledge. The information that was leaked to WAPO contained far more intricate detail than Trump talked about. Because all Trump talked about vaguely was the ISIS threat that, uh, of the laptops. So the, this leak is a major national security leak. Major, how are you doing, babe? You okay? Okay. You like the jacket? Okay. It was a, it's a major national security leak. So the leak, and here's how deep the leak is. Here's how deep the leak is. When I ask questions on my sources, they won't even talk to me. Everybody inside, this is an all hands on deck meeting to find the leaker. They don't care. They don't care that, that Trump looked bad by the WAPO story. No, 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 no. Let me be clear. They don't care that Trump looked bad because what Trump talked about in the meeting wasn't even a big deal. He didn't talk about anything that wasn't already known, right? The reason there's an all points bulletin, all hands on deck, total freaking the F-U-C-K out, and they are freaking out, is because the information that was leaked to WAPO contained more detail than Trump discussed. That, that is a major threat to national security. And now everybody, they're not freaking out about that Trump might look bad. They are freaking out that more information than Trump discussed was disclosed to the WAPO. That is how serious it is. And that is why everybody is freaking out, man. I'm telling you. And the information disclosed was at such a minute level that if it wasn't encrypted and the Chinese or somebody, you know, had spyware on the WAPO computers thing, it outed sources. The information that was leaked to the WAPO, again, let me be very clear with the nuance here. The information that was leaked to the WAPO went well beyond, well beyond what Trump discussed. And the information that was leaked to WAPO contained such granular detail that anybody who had installed spyware or malware or ransomware on the WAPO reporters' phones or computers, they can now find the people who actually, by name, by name are responsible for that. So that is why people are saying, you know, everybody in the White House seems really pissed. They heard them screaming, right? So they, there was actually a report that they, and this is true, they had to turn the TV up. Uh, because the White House press, co uh, the press corps could overhear Bannon and Spice. They were screaming. They were. That's all true. They had to put the TV on blast because they were all screaming, and they weren't screaming because Trump leaked. They were screaming because whoever leaked that story put out way more information, way more information than Trump did, which has now jeopardized the lives of sources. And they have to find a way to get the sources out. It's a, it's a national security crisis. And the national security crisis, again, was not caused by Trump during his meeting. The national security crisis was caused by the person who leaked more detail than Trump talked about. This is now being treated as a, a serious felony. This is now being treated, like I said, that is the real reason they're all furious. And that is the real, and my sources now have said, they've told me they go, look. Right now, because of this investigation, they, we can't talk to you about anything now. So I, I got what I got, and now nobody will even talk about it because it's now a major, major, major investigation. Nobody's want to talk. So the thing that you notice is more details are coming out. Was it Israel? Was it whoever? I don't know what to tell you guys, but I wouldn't trust those sources, and here's why. 
people are freaking out. I, this is a big investigation now. Whoever leaked this information, they're going to go to prison. The people who leaked this information, this is prison. So I want to know who the hell is, who, who are all these sources? NBC has them, NY Times, WAPO, everybody has sources giving them information about highly classified information at the highest level of classification, right? No, nobody's talking because people are going to go to prison over this. That is what we're at now because, again, the information leaked to WAPO went well beyond what Trump talked about. So I don't believe any of these sources that I'm hearing now because everybody is spooked. We're talking prison now. We're not talking – the stories that I get are never involving classified information. The stories that I get are the kind of stories that maybe they don't want leaked to the press or maybe they want to keep under wraps. But I've never disclosed a story that would ever involve classified information, right? Because that is what gets people in prison. So this story involved some of the highest, most classified information and because of that, it will, people will potentially go to prison over this. So I would not believe these people claiming they have multiple sources. Bullshit. Anybody who knows what is really going on is freaking out. Anybody who actually knows the stakes here with this story are freaking out and clamming up, and they ain't talking to nobody. They're not talking to anybody. So anybody now talking about they have sources, they're full of shit. They don't have it because nobody wants to talk about this because – People are – journalists are going to be subpoenaed. There's going to be all kinds of stuff going on with this. So I would not believe anybody claiming that they have sources because that's just not true. So the question is who did it? If you want me to tell you who I think did it, hit the like button on Periscope and hit the like button on YouTube and subscribe on YouTube. So you might think that I'm just going to say 100% McMaster did it. That's what people are going to think. But I'm going to develop this more on the probabilities of what happened, what looks like what like, likely happened, okay? So hit the like button on YouTube. Hit the like button here. Subscribe on YouTube. Did you notice that McMaster recently hired a pro-Hamas person? You're, uh, you know, a lot of you aren't going to believe this, but you can fact check me in real time. McMaster recently hired a pro-Hamas person. Um, to work with him at the NSC here. I'll see if I can find you the guy's name right away. So th this, you can't make this kind of stuff up, right? There is a guy who is, he's pro Hamas and he now works for uh, classified information here. I'll, I'll give you, um, I'll give you the hiring, the hiring name pro Hamas. Let me, let me find it. Pro Hamas. So McMaster does not like Israel at all. McMaster does not like Israel at all. And, you know, I know a lot of people are Israel foreign policy skeptics, and I understand that. I am, I don't hate Israel or love Israel. I believe that I'm what you would call an Israel foreign policy skeptic, which is that I don't automatically assume everything we do should be great for Israel. You know, we need, it's a trade. We need to give and take from Israel. So I'm not, I, I'm not one of those people who are like, yeah, man, you know, Israel is the greatest in the world. My position on Israel is, hey, if they give us something good, it is, it is give and take. But even by my standards, this is beyond the pale. Even as an Israel foreign policy skeptic like myself, the National Security Council's new pro-Hamas Israel advisor, the swamp strikes back against Israel and Trump. Chris Bauman the National Security Council's new point man on Israel believes that the, quote, Israel lobby, unquote, is a threat and that Israel should be pressured into making concessions to Islamic terrorists. And when he worked with the Obama administration, he said the Obama administration must find creative ways to include Hamas in a solution. This is who McMaster brought on here. I'll show you, you know, show you on Periscope here. You can find this article for yourself. So there's actually a le legitimate now terrorist sympathizer in the National Security Council. A pro-Hamas figure was brought in by McMaster. Can you believe this now? There is now a pro-Hamas figure working in the National Security Council covering Israel. So a few people have wondered if maybe, maybe Chris Bauman was the source of the leak. Because 
The leak has been highly damaging potentially to our relationship with the partner who gave it to us. So a lot of people are wondering if maybe Bauman, because he hates Israel and is anti-Zionist, a lot of people are wondering if he leaked it as a way to damage our relationship with Israel. So that's one of the suspects. By the way, I'm not telling you who did it because I don't know who did it. I don't know with, I don't know with absolute, I know who I think did it. I'll tell you who I think did it, of course. I definitely, I definitely, I definitely know who I think did it, but that's a different conversation. I'm telling you the best available intelligence that I have. So many people believe that it was Chris Bauman because he hates Israel so much that he wants to damage our relationship with Israel. So that's one theory. That's one theory. Another theory is that it was David Lofman. Do you guys remember David Lofman? So for those of you who don't, for those of you who don't remember him, a lot of people don't know because this is a story I broke before the Susan Rice story, so nobody believed it. Now everybody knows my sourcing is clear. So David Lofman is actually, he's the chief of counterespionage at the FBI. So every kind of information about national security, good groups say, okay, you're blocked. See, this is a thinking person's podcast. This is a thinking person's, if you just want me to tell you what to think, Leave Periscope and leave YouTube. If you don't want me to tell you how to think and how we develop evidence and the reasoning that we use and the, the analytics behind this and the analysis, then you should just leave because I'm not here to tell you what to think. That's what the fake news media does. You can go watch fake taper and all the fake news and they'll just tell you what to think. We don't know. I don't know 100% who did it. That's the whole point. And I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you who did it because then only dumb people will watch me and I want intelligent, independent thinkers to watch me. By the way, if you're on YouTube, hit the like button and hit the subscribe button. And God bless Alex Jones because I love doing the Alex Jones show. But when I go on the Alex Jones show, I have to be more pithy. I have to get to the point right away because the conversational style is going to differ. But those of you who aren't used to watching my live streams, I go into depth. I go into nuance, analysis, and I give you facts and evidence. I give you my logical reasoning train. It's a completely different experience, okay? But when I'm on a, the Alex Jones show, it's a little bit different. You know, we, it's a different style. And they're both good. They're both good. I love, do, love doing it. But my, when I go solo, I like to develop streams, okay, streams of thoughts. So a story I broke in February was that David Lofman was the source of the leaks, okay? So David Lofman was a major, major, major source of leaks, okay? A lot of people don't know about David Lofman, so I'll tell you about David Lofman because the fake news media, the fake news media hasn't want, wanted to tell you, you know about David Lofman. So David Lofman was an Obama holdover who, you can't make this up, donated donated to Obama, and he was in charge of investigating whom? Oh, the Clinton email thing. Is this all coming together now? Is this all coming together now? So David Lofman, who's chief of espionage at the FBI, is an Obama donor, and he was also responsible for clearing Hillary Clinton. So you can Google David Lofman. Not many people have this story. I broke it, but nobody believed it because it wasn't confirmed by the mainstream media, right? So what I find interesting is that when I break a big story like Susan Rice, nobody believes it, including some of you watching, until the mainstream media confirms it. And then once they confirm it, people are like, oh, wow, Cernovich is breaking all this news. I've been breaking news for a long time. I broke this David Lofman story back in February, right? I broke it back in February. But because I hadn't you know, been validated by the fake news media and the mainstream, Nobody believed it. So David Lofman is an Obama holdover, and he was also the one who led the independent investigation in the Clinton email probe. So isn't it interesting? David Lofman, Comey. So why do you think Comey was put, put out? Comey was put out because of Lofman. Trump can't get rid of Lofman yet, though. And there's a reason for that. There's a, you know, that we can go into another time, but Trump can't get rid of Lofman yet. So David Lofman had caused high problems of morale within the FBI. And I'll tell you why. This is exact quotes. 
the same, you know, I've been breaking Susan Rice and all these stories about Saudi Arabia and the, the Saudi Arabia visit, the weapons deal and everything. Well, this Lofman story I had, but because I'd never had my reporting confirmed by the fake news media, nobody believed the Lofman story. But this is actually a bigger story than Susan Rice, in my opinion, because he's leaking classified information. This is treason, felony. So I'll tell you what my sources told me, multiple. The FBI prides itself as being seen as apolitical, one source told me, and are frustrated that they are being accused of playing politics. Gee whiz, does that sound like Trump's rationale for firing Comey? Does that sound like Trump's rationale for firing Comey? Interesting. Interesting how the news that I broke back in February foreshadowed, foreshadowed everything that has been happening about these leaks and who's really – interesting, right? But nobody believed it because the fake news media never gave me the stamp of approval. So those of you who need the fake news media to confirm my reporting, you should just leave now. Don't watch me. I need independent thinkers, not people who believe the fake news media and only believe me when I'm confirmed by them. So DOJ has been completely politicized by Obama's appointees, a member of the intelligence community for me, leading to major conflicts with the FBI. Lofman, who had donated to Obama's presidential campaign fund in past election cycles, was a DOJ official who investigated Hillary Clinton in what was promised to be an independent investigation. How an Obama donor could be trusted to investigate Obama's heir apparent was never explored by the fake news media. So isn't that fascinating how the fake news media goes, oh, Hillary Clinton was cleared by the FBI. Well, well wait a minute. The person who led the independent investigation was an Obama donor. Does anybody want to explain to me how that's an independent investigation? You, and you can verify. You can find the campaign records and everything else. This is all, you know. So the guy who led the investigation to Hillary Clinton was independent, but he was an Obama donor, and he was helping the heir apparent to Obama. You go ahead and explain that. explain that one to me. I would love to hear that. So Obama, because he's chief of counterintelligence, has all classified information regarding espionage passed by his desk. So what a lot of people didn't know was that the reason all these leaks were happening is because Lofman changed a protocol so that anything that was classified about Russia or Saudi Arabia or Trump's meeting with Russia has to go by his desk. Why? Because there's an investigation into counterespionage into Russia. Are you putting the dots together now? So an Obama holdover, David Lofman, he's chief of counterintelligence, and he has all classified information regarding espionage passed by his desk. Fascinating, right? So my belief, my personal belief, is Lofman leaked it. That is my, that is who I believe leaked it. I believe Lofman leaked it because he, he, even though he wasn't in the room, he would have had the meetings and the notes and everything else. So my belief is that it was David Lofman who leaked it. But I don't know that for sure, you know, so I'm not going to say 100% he did it, but he has leaked information in the past, and he would have had access to this kind of information. Third suspect is McMaster. Here's why I think it's plausible McMaster leaked it. This is just basic running game, okay? So McMaster, as you know, was having a lot of problems with Donald Trump. They were having a lot of drama. Well, what better way, what better way to repair your relationship with Trump than to leak a major story, create a major crisis, and then run out into the field and say, I got your back, Trump. I'll talk to the media, Trump. I, I'm going to go here and I'm going to just smash these fake news media people, right? Think about that. So because there was a major, major, major issue between McMaster and Trump and McMaster was on the way out, well, what you can do is you can create a disaster and then come to the rescue of Trump, and then that is how you repair the relationship. You create a crisis, right? Now, the flip side to that the flip side to that is even if, and this is how I'm teaching you how to think, hit the like button if you're making sense. Hit the like button if, you're, if you want to hear, you know, a real full analysis instead of a sound bite. 
because I don't give, you know, I don't want to give you the CNN, 10 people, sound bite, interrupt each other, cut off a little thing, right? I want to give you a fully developed case, and then I also like to give you the counterpoint. So hit the like button on YouTube, hit the subscribe button on YouTube if you like what I have to say and you want to hear more. So here's why the McMaster theory could be wrong. Even if McMaster weren't the leak, he would want to defend Trump, right? So right away, I can show you the holes in my reasoning, right? So on the one hand, it would make sense for the leak to have come from McMaster because then McMaster could create a major, major crisis with Trump. Then he could come in and rush to Trump's rescue and then repair that relationship, right? But even if he didn't, even if he didn't leak it, then he would have to come to Trump's rescue, right? So that's why the McMaster thing, you know, could be, maybe not, but you don't want to get caught up in a confirmation bias trap. You're saying, aha, McMaster is doing exactly what we would expect him to do if he leaked the story. Well, that's true. What is also true is McMaster is doing exactly what we would expect him to do if he had not leaked the story. Right, so that's what I mean by the logic of the position is, you you know, if you look at things like a lawyer does or a journalist or somebody who's analytical, you look at this from both sides and you say, well, yeah, but that would be the counter argument. So I don't, you know, so that's the thing. That's why I'm telling you I don't know. So my personal belief is that it was Lofman or his people. Now, more evidence, more evidence against McMaster is that McMaster has had nightly conversations with Petraeus. The White House comms department has set these up, and McMaster has disclosed classified information to Petraeus, who had his security clearance pulled after he shared classified information with his mistress. So now let's go into the McMaster-Petraeus connection. Petraeus had disclosed classified information to his mistress. So we know Petraeus can't be trusted, and that is why Petraeus was charged with a felony, and then because he was so well connected, it was pleaded down to a misdemeanor. But he had his classified, um, his top secret IS clearance pulled. Right? Well, McMaster and Petraeus talk every night, and that is where a lot of the stories about Bannon are coming from. They're coming from McMaster's people. And that is also why McMaster and Hope Hicks are having a big drama, because Hope Hicks had told McMaster, hey, quit meeting with Petraeus' PR people. You need to you know, be on the White House message. And then McMaster screamed and said, I'll never listen to that high schooler. I'll never listen to that high schooler Hope Hicks, right? So there's already been, there is already a precedent of McMaster discussing classified information with Petraeus, who, of course, has shared classified information before with his mistress, right? So the McMaster, Petraeus, line of reasoning is persuasive in that regard but the truth is we don't know yet so i would say number one would be my top suspect is lofman that is my number one david lofman is my number one suspect because he was an obama donor he did everything he could to cover up for hillary clinton his leaked stuff in the past that's my number one number two would be mcmaster and petraeus number three would be bauman the pro-Hamas hire the NSC. So if you are pro-Hamas and you want to damage our relationship with Israel, then that what better way to do it than to leak classified information that we allegedly got from Israel, right? So if you wanted to help Hamas, like, like this guy in the NSC does, then what you would do is you would want to damage our relationship with Israel to help Hamas. Interesting, right? And by the way, People will tell you, I'm not Mr. You know, Israel first. I'm at what you would call, I believe we should treat Israel like we treat everybody else, which is, hey, give and take. All right, you give us something, we'll give you something kind of thing. I don't, I'm not one of those people who are just like, oh, yeah, Israel is our greatest ally and everything. You know, we got to have a negotiation. But America has to come first. America first. So that is another issue. Now, another theory, of course, another theory, of course, is that the Russians leaked it to Israel, but here's why that's not true. The reason we know the Russians weren't the ones, and this is the reason that I brought that up. You want to, Isaira, want to say hi? The reason I didn't bring up the Russians 
is because the details that were leaked to the Washington Post. There, so she wants to know. Oh, okay, great. So the reason I didn't, I hate when you come up. So the reason I didn't um, talk about the Russians is because the information that was leaked to WAPO went beyond what was discussed in the meeting, right? So that's why I don't think the Russians did it because the information WAPO had went well beyond what Trump told the Russians. So it couldn't have been the Russians. So that leaves Trump, Tillerson, and McMaster who could have leaked it. But remember, too, Lofman would have got meeting notes of that. And he would have known, oh, they talked about this, so let me, let me add a little bit of spice to this to make it a better story, make it a better story. Right? So that's why I don't think it was the Russians. But this is interesting. I mean, this is a real – that is why I told you this is either the biggest fake news story in the world – or it is the biggest story of the year. But the reason it is big isn't because of what Trump allegedly talked about. The reason it's big is because whoever leaked this information to the Washington Post has put the lives of American intelligence members and American Special Forces soldiers into great danger. So the real story here, again, isn't, it isn't what Trump talked about. is what was disclosed to the Washington Post. That's why it's so big. Now, another kind of quick point I'll talk about, and then we'll take a few questions. An another sort of quick point is that let's just assume, because, again, we're logic. When you have these long streams of me, like people who have known me a long time will tell you, I like to be very deliberative in my thinking. When I'm on Twitter, it looks like there's nothing in put into that. But to be as effective as I am on Twitter, I think about what I write for hours a day. Like my brain is always on. And you're getting kind of a look inside my brain. Here's how I think about things. Here's how I weigh and measure evidence. So here's, here's another kind of thing to think about. Let's just assume for the sake of argument that Trump said too much in that meeting, right? So let us, let us assume for the sake of argument that Trump said too much in that meeting. Would it help us or hurt us with our intelligence partners to have that become the biggest story in the world? Right, so let's re let me um, rephrase that again and reframe it as assume for the sake of argument only that Trump did talk about more than he should have in that meeting he had with the Russians. Would it help us or hurt us for the whole world now to know that Trump disclosed it? Right? It's a catastrophe. So why in the world would you leak that to the journalists unless you wanted to hurt Trump and hurt our relationship with our partners? Right? Why would you want that to be the number one story in the world? The only person who would want that to be the number one, hey, Julius, get over here. Come here. The only reason you would want to get that out is to hurt our, our relationship with our partners. You should, you know, most people, if, for example, if it had been me and Trump had set, gave away too much detail, then what I would do is I would say, all right, guys, like, we better be careful with what we tell Trump because who knows who's going to tell us to, right? But you don't go to the media and say, hey, we want this to be the number one story in the world. That way, our, that way our partners that we work with to fight terrorism all know that anything you tell us could get their people killed. Right? Think, think about the reasoning of that for a second. Is, hey, we now want everybody who would be our potential partners in the war on terrorism to know that if they talk to us, that, hey, they might be murdered. Their families might be killed. Why in the world would you want that out there? Why in the world? Would you want that to be the narrative? Think about that. That doesn't make any sense, right? In what world would you want our partners to believe that they couldn't trust us? Madness, right? Complete madness that you would want that story to get out. You would be doing damage control internally, and then you would just say, be careful what you tell Trump. That is what you would do. You would do massive damage control but now our relationships with our partners on terrorism, and this again is why people are freaking out. The reason that our relationship with our partners is being damaged is now they don't know if they tell something, maybe Trump will let it out, even though it's fake news, right? Even though it's fake, well, I don't want to say it's fully fake news. What was told to the Washington Post is true. The story that Trump leaked it was false. The Washington Post was played by their sources. So let me, let me say that again. So if you only take away three sentences of this and you want to tweet it out or, you know, give me the summary of it, it's that. 
The story the Washington Post published was true in that the information it contained from sources involving details of classified information was accurate. But the Washington Post was plagued by their sources because Trump never actually disclosed what the sources claimed. And this is a big risk in journalism. A big risk in journalism is that you might get played by a source because what a lot of sources will do is they'll tell you things because they have an agenda, right? A lot of times people, that's why the first thing I ask my sources when they tell me about somebody is I go, who do you want to get fired? And they kind of laugh. And that is why a lot of people don't give me um, stories anymore because I won't publish their lies. So I'm not going to get played by a source the way the fake news media does. So what, what will happen if a source tells you, hey, Trump talked about this, this, and this in a meeting, you're going to publish that if you're the Washington Post. You're the New York Times, you're going to publish that, right? Because it will hurt Trump. And there's no way for you to know what was covered in that meeting other than to rely on your source. You see what I'm saying? So if your source tells you this, this, and this happened, then it isn't fake news for the Washington Post to report what their sources told them. They were played by their sources, though, because Trump did not talk about the things that the sources claimed he talked about. So this was definitely, definitely an issue of the fake news media being played by the source. And that is, again, hold on a second, I'll let my dog out. That is, again, why... That is, again, why none of my sources would call it fake news. And believe me, I was trying to put words in their mouths. I was like, so what you're saying is this is fake news. And they were like, no, because my sources aren't partisan hacks. My sources are just, you know, real Americans that want America to be great for everybody. So, but sometimes what I want to do is I want to get that quote. Source tells me fake news. And they go, no, you're, you're, it's not fake news, but it kind of is, and here's why. And it doesn't add up is what I kept hearing. They kept saying it doesn't add up. It doesn't make any sense. The detail that WAPO had went way beyond what Trump knew, right? So the detail the Washington Post had went well beyond what Trump knew. So the Washington Post story is true in that they truthfully reported what their sources told them, which was the disclosure of classified information this is a big investigation. I can definitely foresee a lot of people going to prison over this. This is a lot of people. A lot of people could be going to prison over this. Oh, wow. I've been getting some super chats here on YouTube. I, I always forget about the super chat. Um, let me see. How do I look at the super chat? So we get, oh, wow, 100 bucks. Thank you. So we got 20, 50, 20, 50, 10, 100. Thank you, everybody, for the super chats. Definitely appreciate it. That's how we fund, you know, that's how we fund the journalistic operation. But anyway, that's all I have to say about the big story from WAPO. Now we're going to talk about Seth Rich. Well, do you want me to talk about Seth Rich? Do you want me to kill this Periscope and start a new one on Seth Rich? Do you want me to kill this YouTube and start a new one on Seth Rich? Or do you just want me to stay live and talk about Seth Rich? So if you want me to talk about Seth Rich and you're on YouTube – then hit the like button on YouTube. Yeah, so if you, so if you, yeah, if you're on YouTube, hit the like button. If you want me to talk about Seth Rich, just talk. All right. So now I can tell you what I knew about Seth Rich, but I had an embargo on. I can tell you what I knew about Seth Rich, but I was not allowed to talk about it. So I had a big party in, well, it wasn't my party. I'm taking credit for other people's work. I attended an event in D.C. with a, that Jim Hoff posted, or hosted, right? During that meeting, I was told there is going to be a big story about Seth Rich come from the Washington Post. I said, what? The Washington Post is never going to publish anything about Seth Rich. And it, the, the, the party was on a Friday, and I was told on a Monday, and I have confirmed this, that the Washington Post is going to publish a big story on Seth Rich on Monday, right? But it never ran. And I thought, well, why didn't it run? Why didn't it run? 
That was, you know, that was like really weird to me. Why didn't it run? So then a lot of you, and, the, and the, according to the source, and I have this confirmed by other people, it contained new information that would tie Seth Rich to WikiLeaks. And I thought, well, you know, who has the story? What are they doing? So a lot of people wondered, because if you notice on January, or on April 20th and April 21st, I was talking a lot about Seth Rich. So a lot of people go, what is this, Cernovich? So I, I posted this vague, so if you go to my, you know, if you went to my if you went to my Twitter page, right, you can see that I posted on April 20th and April 21st. I posted Seth Rich on April 20th and I posted Seth Rich on April 21st. And that was all that I had posted. The only thing that I had posted was his name. And that is because I knew there was going to be a big story about Seth Rich. But I was told it couldn't be it couldn't be broken from me. You know, it had to be it had to be broken from you know, from other people. So that that's the thing. So now, of course, now, of course, Fox DC broke the story about Seth Rich. Now, here's, here's going to be my first question about Seth Rich. Have you ever seen anybody in the Democrat Party dressed like this? Here, I'm going to show it to YouTube. And I'm going to show it to YouTube. When you go to a DNC event, they don't have American flags there. Show me a Democrat who dresses like an American like this, like an American patriot. Right? So Seth Rich was a DNC staffer, but you can find multiple pictures of him. Yeah, if you saw this guy, that's a great way to put it. If I just told you, you have to guess, is this a Trump voter or a Hillary voter? And you're going to have to bet money. Right? If I said to you, hey, we're going to have to bet money, is this a Trump supporter or a Hillary Clinton supporter, and you had to put money on it, no way in the world would you guess that's a Hillary Clinton supporter. You would never say, you would never say oh, yeah, I've guessed Hillary Clinton, because you would lose that bet nine times out of ten, right? That's not the way Hillary Clinton supporters look. Hey, is Grandma still here? Yeah. Aw. So Seth Rich was an American patriot who believed in the Democrat Party. And then what had happened is he found out about the rigging, the rigging election. He found out that Hillary Clinton had rigged the election, the DNC had rigged the election. And he didn't – here, you want to come hang out, kiddo? And he didn't want he, – he was a true believer. He didn't realize, like we know, that the Democrats are the totalitarians, that they're the ones who hate America. That they're the ones who don't like, you know. Yeah, you look at the iPad. You want to talk about Seth Rich? So they had. So the story broke. Fox News DC. This is all over now. People are trying to call it fake news, but I didn't break this story. I was told specifically I couldn't. So I had, I had the Seth Rich story actually, but I was told specifically it can't come from you because it'll be more credible if it comes from other people. But I've known about this. Is that the story when you tweeted on Sunday that you have a story, but you're going to wait for it to develop? Shh. You tweeted it. I know. Oh, is that it? Oh. Shauna's, you know. What? Yeah, and I did tweet on Sunday, I have a big story. I'm waiting for it to develop more. But, you know, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to give exact dates. We tweeted things. Oh, okay. But anyway, there, um, this is why I don't tell Shauna my sources. <laughs> <laughs> Sean has no idea who I talk to or what I'm up to, and there's there's number one reason why. So Fox 5 DC has broken the story about Seth Rich, that there is evidence that he emailed WikiLeaks, right? So now people are trying to attack me, but I am not the one who broke the story. There's a reason for that, because if I had broken the story, people could attack it more, Right? So there's a re yeah, Shauna gets to the point, yeah. Yeah, they, they're all saying that they're laughing, they think it's great. And then I saw another interaction with Ali that I thought was very, very appalling. Hey Shauna, if I had died and my claim spokesman when asked about my death said LOL, what would you what would you say to that? Said LOL? He said LOL about me dying. I'll kill him. What if you said what if somebody so Al, this is what Ali tweeted? It is imperative that someone get in touch with the Seth Rich family and show them what Brad Baum is saying in the press. They likely don't know. 
So this guy says, LOL, oh, they know. What would you think about that if my spokesman had said, LOL, about my death? This happened, guys. Ali can confirm it, dude. I screen capped it. This is all verified accounts. You know, this is all really, you know, L tell me what's funny about Seth Rich's death. So that is his spokesman, good friend of his. So apparently the family spokesman, who, by the way, is paid by the DNC, right? So you go, this really happened, guys. This is so, you know, Shauna's over here just like, she can't believe it's true. But it is. You can find the exchange on Twitter. I tweeted out. Here, I'll, I'll read you the retweet so you can just go to the top of my timeline and, and find it. So I want to know what is funny about Seth Rich dying, and I want to know why the spokesperson is saying LOL. Right? That is the person speaking on behalf of the family. What is going on? And the person, that spokesperson is, of course, he works for the DNC. Yeah. So here's what we know about the DNC. The DNC is being sued for not paying its employees overtime, for not paying its employees at all. The DNC doesn't do anything for free. Nobody who works for the DNC does anything pro bono. That, that is, you're saying it's a loser troll. It's not a troll. That's his spokesperson. Ask Ali. Ali Ali's here right now at ALI. He's the one who asked the guy, you know, does the family know what you're even talking about? And the guy said, LOL, oh, they know. LOL, oh, they know. I don't think that's funny. I. Uh, Right, that really tells you everything that you need to know. So he's saying, oh, it's pro bono and this. I don't believe any of that because I don't think that's funny. I think that if I died and, you know, Sean was grief-stricken and we had a spokesperson on us, if that person said LOL on Twitter about me dying, about my death, that, that would mortify, be incredible, right? So I don't think the family actually knows what is going on. And, or maybe they've been threatened. I don't really know. But I know that anybody who says LOL about the death of somebody, that isn't a friend. That is a person. That isn't a good person. That is a craven and dishonest and very, very evil person. I can't believe it. What would you think, Syra? They go, LOL, your dad died. LOL. I wouldn't think that's very funny, would you? Here, for those of you who want to see Syra. So, yeah, maybe the family was threatened. Here's Syra, for those of you. So, the Seth, now, Kim.com who, by the way, is one of the world's most plugged-in experts on Internet security. Kim.com tweeted out today, too, that Seth Rich was the source of the WikiLeaks. So we know that for a fact, that Kim.com was one of the most plugged-in person in the world when it comes to cybersecurity, cyber knowledge, NSA spying, everything. He's the number one source on this kind of stuff. He had said that, here you go, you can, so you can find this tweet for yourself. So he had said, Seth Rick was the WikiLeaks DNC, not the source of the Podesta emails, but the DNC leaks about the rigged election. Right? So that's Kim.com. So we now have, so we now have Kim.com. Kim.com says it was Seth Rich who gave the DNC leaks. Okay? Um, we have multiple investigators, including former homicide detectives. Yeah saying that there's evidence that Seth Rich had emailed WikiLeaks. We also know that CrowdStrike, which investigated the DNC leaks, they never turned their servers over to the FBI. Right? Why is that? You can fact check this too. The FBI asked to look at the servers of the DNC about the hack, and they would never give them access to their servers. Why is that? Because there was no hack. There was a leak. There was no hack. There was no DNC hack. Those emails showing collusion amongst the fake news media, those people. Yeah, and why can't, where's the computer? Where's the computer? Why is the computer relevant for the homicide investigation? Hand over the computer. Well, it's damaged now. It's been compromised, you know, and everything else. So that would be the thing. Why will the DNC, why was the robbery nothing taken? Right? Why, why was there nothing taken? What are you looking at? You already showed her. I already showed him, Sarah. There's Sarah. She's chewing. She's teething. So, yeah, the Seth Rich story is another breaking story. There's so much going on today. Why does the spokesman not want the FBI to cooperate with the family? Ali, great, great account on Twitter, at ALI. Ali's a great account. Everybody should follow Ali. I don't know how he got ALI, you know? How, I wish I had Mike. 
Wish I had the mic twist. You know, he must have been an early South by Southwest adapter. So that's the point is there are all these questions that nobody will answer. And when you ask the family spokesman a question, they go, LOL. So they won't cooperate with the FBI. The DNC servers were never handed over. The Seth Rich family spokesman, if you ask him about Seth Rich's death, goes, LOL. LOL. Oh, so funny, bro. So funny. A 27-year-old was killed in a robbery. No money was taken. No phone was taken. Nothing was taken. It was an assassination. We, a robbery, they don't go shoot you in the back in a robbery, right? In what robbery do they go behind you and shoot you like it's a mob hit? And they're not stealing anything. And they're not stealing anything. Not run his pockets or anything. Well, I would love to, I would love to see all the robberies where that happens assassination mob level hit shot in the back and nothing taken i'd like to, you know i'd like to hear more because i've been a lawyer i've defended criminals so i know a lot about robbery i actually know about this kind of stuff that isn't the way the robbery goes in a robbery they go run your pockets right that sort of slang like put your hands in your pockets give me your stuff so in a robbery, they go run your pockets, and you run you run your pockets. You give them what you got, and then a lot of times they'll say, "Put it on the ground, turn around, and run away." So the way it would have worked, the only way you would have got shot in the back in a robbery, is what would have happened is they would have said, "Run your pockets, put all your stuff on the ground, turn around." Then they shoot you in the back, grab your stuff, and leave. Right? But then, where did he run his pockets? You want to talk? What do you have to say about Seth Rich? Can you say his name was Seth Rich? Do it. Can you say lock her up? Can you say lock her up? Yeah, you want to lock her up? Should we lock up Hillary Clinton? Smart. Okay, I mean, you heard it from her. She just said, yeah, lock her up right there. She's saying it. She's saying lock her up, guys. You heard it. Cyrus June is saying lock her up. You all heard it here first, exclusive. She knows Hillary Clinton is uh, an evil, evil person. The way, the way I've always described Hillary Clinton is that if you got on Trump's bad side, he's going to tweet nasty things about you, and maybe he'll sue you. The Clintons will kill you. That is the difference. Trump, if you get on his bad side, it'll be a lawsuit, and he'll make your life you know, unpleasant. The Clintons will just straight up kill you. That's why Shauna wants me to retire from journalism, because Shauna knows what the Clintons are about. And that's why if Hillary Clinton had won, we would not be in a country. We'd have left the country. Lock her up. Lock her up. If you're on YouTube, hit the like button and hit the subscribe button. And if you're on Periscope, shh, tap the screen. Oh, so what else is going on? I have been added to a, an official watch list by the Swedish government. There's been so much breaking news. I was so busy last night investigating the – the real story about WAPO that I didn't get a chance to cover everything so much. So the Swedish government has added me to a watch list. This story broke this morning, and what is going on here? I'll, I'll see if I can find it for you. So I, yeah, I've been added by you know the Swedish government's literally. Um, I could be arrested if I go to Sweden. You know, I'll have to go to Schengen. I can't fly into Sweden. I'll, yeah. So the Swedish government has entered me into a database. This, you know, this is breaking news right now. So here, I'll show you. So yeah, I'm now in a, a database, an official Swedish database um, for Sweden, right? So if you're on YouTube here, I'll show it to the YouTubers. So yeah, the, the reason they added me to this is because of my journalism. So I did a documentary called Invasion, how Sweden became the rape capital of the West. So my documentary on... Sweden, an expose into the rape culture of Sweden, the real rape culture, not this you know, fake rape culture stuff that we have in America. But I did a documentary exposing the rape in Sweden. Jack Posobiec, by the way, was part of that project. He went over to Malmo and everything. So if you do journalism on Sweden, they will add you to a government database, the agency database. So I am now officially an enemy of the Swedish government. Can you believe that? I'm officially an enemy because of this documentary. So here's the documentary they don't want you to see. They don't want you to see the documentary called Invasion. So if you want to, so I'm going to retweet to the top of my timeline. 
That way you can go to my Twitter feed and you can find it real quick. So this documentary, Invasion, How Sweden Became the Rape Capital of the West, this documentary is now officially banned by the Swedish government, we can fairly report. So I am now, journalism is now banned. It's, you can watch it for free. No, no I, I funded that myself. You can watch that for free on YouTube. And by the way, Jack Posobiec, you know, he did that at cost too. He wasn't, nobody's getting rich doing this journalism stuff, I'll tell you that. So that was actually funded by my Patreon. So if you're a Patreon, you know, they paid for that. So the Patreon paid, you know, to, um, to get that documentary done. So that's completely, we are completely viewer and reader supported. That's the kind of journalism we do now. It's completely funded by those of you who are the readers and those of you who watch. That's who, that's who supports us. That's the, cause that's the only way to get honest journalism guys. The only, the only way to, um, the only way you can get, um, journalism. Hey Mike, I didn't mean to comment on Periscope to be insulting. I apologize for the wording. So I got blocked. Look guys, yeah, you just, I, don't, I get a lot of nasty people on my periscopes, and I'm just going to, you know, just going to block people. I'm just going to, you know, I just don't have time. If you come into my streams in a bad mood, you know, go do some meditation. Go read Gorilla Mindset. I'm under attack by the Swedish government. I, the, the way people, what people have to understand is I'm under attack. I'm on a hate list, a watch list by the Swedish government. And then people come in and say mean things, my own fans come and insult me and then I block them and they go, oh, you know, why'd you block me? Uh, you know, well, go read Gorilla Mindset, okay? Go get your own life in order, man. The government in Sweden, I have government, government agents trying to, you know, have me in prison. I can't even travel probably to Sweden anymore. So I don't need, you know, I don't need nonsense from everybody else, all right? So what else is going on? What, what else is going on? We'll see. So much going on, guys. So it's been busy. I think we got one more story I want to cover. I want to take calls, too, but I don't have my phone set up. So, unfortunately, I definitely wanted to take some listener calls. I don't know. Can I set up? I might actually be able to. Um, hey, Shauna, could you bring me up my Bose speaker? Do you, guys, do you want me to take calls or have you had enough? Have you had enough, Cernovich? Do you want me to take calls? All right. If you want me to take calls, hit the like button on Periscope and hit the like button on YouTube. And I'll take calls and I'll hear what people have to say, you know, their insights and everything. You know, we'll, we'll take some calls. But I don't want to take calls if you don't want them. So, you know, you, got, you guys got to let me know what you want. You want more of, what you want less of. So yeah, if you want if you want me to take some calls, then I can do it. I can set it up here, but it's gonna take a minute, you know. This stuff doesn't happen just overnight. Oh yeah, there's some um so who is yeah. July 4th is gonna be a big Antifa event in Portland. Guys, I'm so bored by the I'm so I'm so bored by the Antifa stuff. Antifa stuff is played out. There um you know, I funded a lot of that kind of stuff of just to get people to be able to travel there, but the Antifa stuff has played out. You guys got to move on to something else. All right, so let's get let's get this conference call. All right, so you the people have spoken. You do want to take calls, so we'll we'll take a few calls. We'll take um yeah the, the Antifa stuff. It's just it's played out, at least to me. Hey, hey it, anybody can do what they want to do. You know that. Anybody can do what they want to do. It's none of my business, right? But I just personally don't care. I've watched all the streams. I'm bored. There's – now I think it's just a way for people to get, like, e-fame. So I think it started off as something good. I think it started off, like, in a good place where people just wanted to protect speakers. But if all you're going to do is go to an Antifa thing to get into fights with Antifa, hey, man, that's – believe me, that's cool. But I don't want anything to do with that. But if you want, if there's an actual event, if there's an actual event and you want to go defend free speech, I'll support that. I'll defend people who want to support free speech. But if all people want to do is create drama with Antifa, guys, I'm just, I'm so bored with that. But, you know, everybody else can do what they want to do. Hey, uh, Louisiana, how you doing? That's you. Hello? 
Okay. Warren, Michigan, how you doing? Mike, what's up, brother? How you doing? Great. I usually call, me, call you for my other number, the Miami number. Oh, so okay. I just wanted to tell everybody, I'm sure you recognize my voice, there's no question. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to tell everybody that if you're not patient, if you're not patronizing, you really should be. Um, that $15 a month is, is really not that big of a deal. I'm, I'm doing a little bit more, obviously. But um, I just like, I, I know you don't like to ask, but I just want to push it for you. People should be helping out. I mean, there's a lot more that you can do. Like, if you can, I just canceled my HBO, my Showtime, uh, because of that whole fiasco last week. And that was like 40 bucks a month right there. So it's, it's doable, guys. You don't, even, you don't even need cable. I mean, I only keep it because my mom, uh, you know, has to have Western, Western. So, but you don't need all the extra stuff. So use that money and support journalism. That's, that's all I wanted to say, real journalism. Yeah, yeah. I mean, thank you. Yeah, you're right. I don't really pitch this stuff that often um, you, for, for a number of reasons. And it's working great. Yeah, thank you. The books are great and everything. Yeah, I don't really promote my Patreon that heavily. Maybe I should promote it more heavily, but the reason, it, you know, to me, it's just people make choices in their lives, and a lot of people claim there isn't enough journalism out there. You know, they want more honest journalism, and then there's actually people doing journalism, and then they don't want to support that, and then they want to say, well, where, why is the news fake? Well, I, you know, that's why. If, if people want to support it, they can. If they don't, they, um, you know, they don't have to, but it's completely up to the people what they decided, you know, because I'm not real big. And, and another thing interesting for me is that I live a, a good enough lifestyle that I don't, I'm not going to do like the Glenn Beck poverty thing. Oh my God, you know, if you don't fund me, I'm going to go bankrupt, right? Because I don't believe in being insincere, but it's more like I bring people a certain amount of news and honest truth in journalism. I can bring way more if I have way more resources. Last year, I spent $50,000 at least, maybe more, of my own money on journalism. Probably closer to 100000 if you count all the stuff I, I funded that people don't know about. And I put my money where my mouth is, and I think more people should definitely put their money where their mouth is, but they're going to do what they're going to do. Thank you, though, for your support. Appreciate the call. Bro. All right. Hello. My pleasure, brother. See ya. How's it going today? Good. How are you? I'm not. You're all. Well, I'm doing well. Um, I care. Calling about the Louisiana statues and the North Carolina statues. Wanted to know your thoughts on it, and also uh, really appreciate what you're doing. And um, I'm hoping you're protecting yourself. Thank you. Yeah, my my take on the statues is that it's never going to be enough. You know, there, there's you're negotiating with terrorists. I could under you know if if, if in an abstract world that people go. You know what? If you take down these statues, then the SJWs will just be reasonable, and they'll say thank you. They'll say thank you. We were really triggered by this stuff, but now we're happy, and we're going to be content, and we're going to just stop it. Then I could understand it. Oh, yeah? I'm, don't give them an inch. You can't give them an inch. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I totally agree with you. I'm, I'm here. I live here. I'm, I'm born and raised here. Um, by no means a racist, certainly I'm proud that I am white. I'm not scared of that at all. Um, the fact is, is that he's amending history. Well, I mean, they want to pretend it didn't happen. So, I mean, I, I understand it, all it, Exactly. I understand all their perspectives. And philosophically, they're not comfortable with the idea that people can agree that you can be a good man, maybe fighting for a bad cause, right? And a lot of people have trouble with that. The whole idea with the statues were to give people positive role models, right? Positive role models, and that's all it was about. That they're exactly. positive. So whether you agree with the war, you know, whatever, that isn't even an issue. The issue is the um, people, you know, there were certain gentlemanly values. Robert E. Lee was known as a gentleman. Chivalry was good. Robert E. Lee, by the way, if he had wanted to, he could have told the Southern boys, he could have said, you know what, we're not going to give in to the Yankees, go back into your hills, and we'll just have guerrilla warfare. We could have had an insurgent yeah, warfare, I mean, and definitely, and Lee said, no, I want everybody to go home, return to your farms, and let's just rebuild and unite. I think that's a noble thing, because Lee could have just said, hey, man, there's still a, still a few of you, you know, thousands of you, just go into the hills now, 
And if you see a Yankee soldier or carpetbagger, just snipe them. And they would have done it. There could be guerrilla warfare. And instead, he said, okay, we fall. Well, we, we know the solution is education. We know the solution. you got to kill ignorance. The problem is, is when we have an ignorant mayor that doesn't take the opportunity to put placards or information that has been, has been history amended over the last 50 years. Um, but people will learn things a little bit. You walk up to it and say, hey, I know a little more. Yeah, so I, yeah, so again, my take on all the statute stuff is just, we're at the point now where you can't give the, the far left an inch. You just can't give them anything because it's You're not right. enough. And the next statutes they're going to go for is Thomas Jefferson and George Washington because they own slaves. That is all coming. Well, yeah, I mean, that's when, what's coming next. So, when do we stop? Yeah, there is no. That's the whole point. These are um, that, the, that the bigots. The, the pyramids. Yeah, the, the far left are bigots and they hate America. They hate uh, white people. You. Yeah, so thanks for your call. Thanks, Mike. I'll let you get on to the next project and uh, keep on that Seth Rich story, Young Right Path. Thank you. Yeah, that's the whole statue thing. Is they're not going to say thank, thank you. you. They're not going to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. They're not going to say thank you for taking down the statue. They're not going to say, "Wow, thanks. I'm glad you guys did this." They're going to say, "Great, we took down that monument. Let's go take down a bunch more." That's how it always works. We've watched this movie too many times now. So we're at the point now where you can't compromise, you can't apologize, you can't give them anything because they aren't they aren't reasonable people. We have some super chats come in. There's not a GD think funny about Seth Rich being murdered. What's wrong with him? I agree, man. I definitely agree. If someone at a DNC event dressed like Seth Rich did with that flag outfit, they would catch on fire immediately. Wow, that is – I'm, I'm going to plagiarize you. So I'm actually – that is so good that I have to go on Twitter right now. So, so in, in regards to the picture of, uh, of Seth Rich looking like an American patriot, an American flag apparel, you know, somebody in Super Chat – and said, if you went to a DNC event like that, you'd be caught on fire. That's like a really good comment. So I'll put quotations around it, though. So if you're watching and that was yours, thank you. That's a great, that's a great comment. I have to get that out there. I'm going to tweet that out there. It's a really good tweet. That's a strong Twitter game, my friend. Strong, strong, strong Twitter game. We had Russell. Thanks for everything you do, Cernovich. Well, thank you, Russell, for supporting it. All right, we got a bunch more, bunch more people in line. Wow. Got a lot of people. I guess people have missed me. I think people have missed me. Washington, Louisiana, I think. We called in before. We Hello? Yep. Hello? Yes. All right. Dude. Hi. All right. Hello? Elizabeth Town, New York, how are you doing? Hello? Yeah, Elizabeth Town, New York. Hello? Okay, what is so hard about this, guys? What is so hard about this? Hi, Mike. Albuquerque, New Mexico. How you doing? Hey, hey Mike. How you doing? We, we have missed you. Yeah, sounds like it. Welcome <laughs> back, Evan. Um, doing, I Kevin? had a, just a question for you. Um, at the very beginning of the Periscope today, uh, you had said that, are, are we expecting now that because of this Washington Post story that it's been taken too far and that people, you kind of alluded to maybe people being a little like, wow, this is getting serious. And you said you expect maybe the leaks to stop because people are shooken up now. Um, say that one more time. You had uh, um, talked earlier about maybe the leaks coming out of the, uh, you know, Trump's administration. Maybe they're going to stop because people are kind of shaken up now. And this is a pretty serious thing that's happened with, oh, with uh, yeah, no, I mean, what was leaked to the Washington Post. Well, I mean, here's what I'll tell you. This is what I told Alex Jones in a conversation last night. There, um, you know, a lot of people aren't really going to understand this, but. There, um, what I told him is I said, look, Alex, mm -hmm. Trump, mm -hmm. isn't, Trump isn't listening to the people who got him elected. Trump is rewarding the never-Trumpers and the people who sabotaged him. This is a bad story for Trump. This is a bad story for Trump, a horrendous story for Trump, okay? And 
maybe this is what he needed, a wake-up call. Who's actually getting results? Who is actually – so I told Alex Jones, I said, look, man, Trump needed a bloody nose. He needed to know that these never-Trumpers have sabotaged him and that he needs to listen to Alex Jones, Roger Stone, Paul Joseph Watson, Stefan Molyneux, Mike Cernovich, the Patriots, the Freedom Fighters. So, hey, man, I, you know, I got no sympathy for Trump right now because he let the snakes in his office. So he got a bloody nose out of this because he doesn't have the – he's not listening to the Freedom Fighters, right? So my, my outlook on that is what happened is going to maybe wake him up. Take a nice punch in your face. Realize, realize who has your back and who doesn't. And you better, you know, respond accordingly. So I have zero sympathy. Now, as an American, this is creating a national security disaster, making us all a bigger target for terrorists. So as an American, I have a real problem with what happened. But as a Trump supporter, hey, man, you let in the never Trumpers into the White House. You're letting Rex Priebus and other people dictate policy and personnel. Hey, man, you, get, you reap what you sow. I grew up in a very Christian home. And, you know, one of the Bible verses is, that which you soweth, ye shall also reap. Trump sowed never Trumpers into his garden. And now he's got weeds and poison ivy and poison oak and snakes in there and ticks and fleas and all kinds of just diseases, okay? Well, that's what he put in there. I, I, whole, I wholeheartedly agree, and I don't have any sympathy either. Um, yeah, and like going back to his communication team, I mean, it's, the messaging is just a complete and utter disaster. He's not taking advice from anybody who he should be taking advice from. And uh, one, just one other question for you is, do you think that he will uh, replace Priebus? I don't know, man. He should. There's a lot of people I know, a lot of people I know, you know, just awfully frustrated that, you know, the, the way one of my um, people put it is, the only way to get within 100 feet of the White House is to have tweeted that you're never Trump. That's where we're at now with the Trump. So he put in, he put in never Trumpers. So I got no sympathy for Trump right now. He got punched in the face. He can either listen to the freedom fighters and the people who got him elected, or he can keep he, listening to Rents Priebus and Sean Spicer and all those people. But I got, you know, I got no sympathy for him personally. But again, as an American, I'm very troubled by what's happening. Hey, thanks a lot, Mike. Good thanks to talk you. with you again. See ya. Yeah, I mean, that's just the reality. The reality is that never Trumpers are all in the White House running things. Fine. That's who Trump wants to give the White House to are the people who wanted to sabotage him when he ran for office and somehow magically think that they're not going to sabotage him anymore. If that's what he wants to do, man, then that is up to him. But I'm not going to sit here feeling sorry for Donald Trump, that's for sure. You're never going to see Mike Cernovich feeling sorry for Donald Trump when Donald Trump is not listening to Mike Cernovich. Just the way it is, man. Uh, Fresno, California, how are you doing? I'm fine, Mike. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Uh, speaking on that, wh where are the GOP, uh, where are the senators in the House of Republicans, uh, the, re the House of Representatives, sorry, for the Republicans? Where, where's their support for Trump? They don't support him. Not only that, but they're actively sabotaging him. That's the whole point. That's why I don't feel sorry for Trump at all. You're not seeing me cry for Trump. I told him this was going to happen. I, I, let me rephrase that. I co it was made very clear to various people what was going to happen if they didn't listen to the people who got him elected. Trump decided to go a different direction, didn't want to listen to, you know, what I said about the media strategy and the press team. He doesn't have any friends hardly in the world. He's got a couple, Kelly and Conway, you know, a couple people, but yeah, he doesn't have any friends in the White House. And other than, you know, well, Kelly and Conway Miller, well, so that's his fault. That's Trump's fault. Not mine, not yours, not the people who got him elected. But it's not, it's not just Trump's fault. It's the GOP. Um, they've, got, they've got people, I mean, they've got a president in the White House now. Are they all so crooked that they're, yes. they're, they're 
with the dims. I mean, I, I read yeah. a new Newsmax article uh, just about an hour ago about uh, Obama's uh, Ob Obama's group uh, targeting 34 Republicans. Um, so I mean, they're organized and they're attacking. And and the senator, I mean, the Republicans that are in office now don't have the gumption whether they agree with Trump or not to fight this. I mean, they obviously know what's going on here. I okay, mean, so the American people. If someone is a beautiful woman and, you know, she's not broke, she's not like economically enslaved, you know. So imagine we have a beautiful woman and her family, you know, if she got into trouble, they could help her out. If this beautiful woman dates, if she dates scumbags, whose fault is that? Is it the fault? Okay, so that we got a dog barking there. So look, guys, here's the reality. We Trump, we know what the GOP is. Trump knows what the GOP is. If Trump wants to get in bed with the GOP, he's a multi-billionaire. He's got a massive supportive uh, of the base. He has all kinds of people who he can have in the positions. If Trump wants to let Brent Priebus and the Never Trumpers take over the White House, I'm not, I'm not going to say that's the GOP's fault. I'm going to put responsibility onto Donald Trump for that. That's why I don't care. No sympathy. You got, you know, this isn't, it's like when beautiful women would say, oh my God, my boyfriend is so mean to me, cry on my shoulder. And then these beta white knights are like, oh, oh one day you'll see that I, you know, take me out of the friend zone, you know, take me out. Oh, one day you'll see who really loves you and will take care of you. Right. I got no time for any of that nonsense. I got no time. For now, there are cases where women have, you know, they don't have any money, they don't have the options because they've been sort of economically terrorized by somebody, and that's a different story. So there are women who are actually abused and they can't get out. Those people I have sympathy for. I understand that. I'm talking about the women with any option in the world, and they're crying about how they're getting cheated on and they're being mistreated and isn't so sad that I'm not. And then these beta males come in and, you know, white knight. Same thing with Trump. I'm not going to white knight for Trump. Trump wants to be upset that he's being sabotaged. Hey, man, that's his fault. If he'd have done what he was told to do, what we said needed to be done back in November, none of this would have happened. So I want Trump to get punched in the face a few more times. Personally, as an American, I don't. But personally, I want Trump punched in the head a few more times. And then he's going to look around and be like, well, what happened to the people who had my back? Where is Cernovich? Where's the base? Where are all the people that were there to get me elected? And he'll look around and say, hey, man, you know, you got new friends, bro. Trump has new friends. Rens Priebus, Sean Spicer, McMaster, those are his friends. Hey, that's his choice. But I'm not going to sit for one minute and feel any sympathy at all for Trump for being betrayed by his new friends. The way I always put it with people, you got a bunch of new friends. Have fun with your friends. God bless you. Get on your merry way, but I don't want to hear about how you're being betrayed by him and how poor, poor, poor are you. Don't care. Baltimore, Maryland, how are you doing? Hey, what's up, Mike? I want to thank you again for all you do. I have three things that I think are really, um, I guess, important recommendations, I guess, for can fodder that I wanted to give you. The first is um, something called a, a strategy for the right. It is an article that was written by Murray Rothbard probably over 20 years ago. And it talked about the strategies, the various strategies the right used over 20 years ago. And what really surprised me about the article is it's just as true today as it was back then. So, for example, he writes, uh, and so the proper strategy for the right wing must be, called, must be what we call right wing populism. Exciting, dynamic, tough, and confrontational, rousing and inspiring. Not only the ex uh, rousing the exploited masses, but often the shell-shocked right-wing intellectual cadre as well. In this era, where the intellectual and media elites are all establishment liberal conservatives, on a deep sense, one variety or another of social democrat, all bitter hostility to the genuine right. We need a dynamic, charismatic leader who has the ability to shortcut the media elites. And to Thank reach you. and rouse the masses directly. Appreciate very very good article. Yeah. Thank you for the call, my friend. What was that article called? Who wrote that? 
It's called uh, A Strategy to the Right by Murray Rothbard. And I have two other really No, no, no. You just skipped the one. That was, that was a long one. So thank you. Strategies oh. for the Right by Murray Rothbard, you said, or Bert Murray Rothman? Yeah. It's Murray Rothbard, and the other guy is Michael Phillips. Beautiful. If you could look him up All right. Thank on you very much. Appreciate it, man. I, I agree, sure. though. We, we needed – we needed a dynamic, energetic leader with charisma who can bypass the media and understands populism and nationalism and we're working on it. So what year was that article published? I'm curious. It was uh, published in 1992, and he yeah. has a bunch of great articles. Prophetic. Most people don't know about this guy, and he's just – he's absolutely great, and I, I was going to recommend the other two people. but That's so good. Okay. Thank you, my friend. Do you want to talk? All right. Bye. Yeah, a lot of people on hold, guys. We get a lot of calls. It's nothing personal. We get a lot of calls. So, you know, you got to kind of, you know, you got to kind of, um, like right now, we just hundreds of people on hold right now. So it's nothing personal, but I want, I like to get as many people in as I possibly can as, um, as we could. All right, we got, um, okay, so we got a bunch of people from New York. So 917. Okay, Ben, is it me? <clears throat> yeah, that's you. All right. Hey, uh, first of all, good to speak to you again. Uh, second of all, uh, his name is Seth Rich. Uh, I wanted to just tell people uh, two things really quick. One, there's a great website now put up by the left called resistbot.io, which makes it easy to contact senators and congressmen. And I've been using it for, you know, our cause, let's say, instead of theirs. So if anyone has a few seconds, definitely go to resistbot.io and use that. And what I really want to do, though, is ask you, when do you think the guillotine is really going to come down on this? Like, when... Uh, when do you think it's finally going to happen that, you know, this White House leader is going to be axed? When do you think that there's going to be some kind of actual, you know, big break in the Seth Rich story? Like, uh, when do you think there's a time, or do you think there is a time that is just sort of unforeseeable? I don't know, man. I, but I do know that other outlets did have the story that Fox DC did. And I do know the Washington Post did have that story a, a long time ago. So that's the thing. We do know that this people know. So this is one of those instances where a lot of people know what is really going on, but people are kind of afraid to talk about it. So my best answer to that question is, honestly, man, I don't know that we ever will have – I don't know that Seth Rich will ever will have justice. That's my honest opinion is that I don't know that he'll ever get justice because people, are, people don't want to talk about it. People are covering it up. John Podesta works for the Washington Post now. So that's my honest answer. I, I mean, if I had to bet – if I have to bet, I bet that Seth Rich will never have justice, that the true killers will at least not be found within the next five or ten years because it was a professional assassination type job. Now, maybe what will happen is – here's what could happen. The, what, what, I, what I can imagine happen is that the, um, some people will approach a criminal who's facing really serious charges and go, going to go to life in prison. And then what they'll do is they'll go and say, hey – We'll, give, we'll take care of your family, and you're going to go to prison for life anyway. We'll take care of your family if you take the charge, take the rap for Seth Rich. So that's what I predict will happen. Is yeah. some, they'll find some guy who's already going to go away for life in prison, and they'll just say, hey, man, your family will be taken care of. They'll have an envelope of cash that's going to show up with this mail drop. You know, All they got to do is go there every two weeks, and they'll get that, the cash. And then some random um, gangbanger who had nothing to do with it will just take the charge. And that'll be the end of it. So that's what I predict will have happen. I, I don't think that he will ever actually truly and have you justice. Think, and do you think uh, that, you know, the Russia Trump leaker, what, what is going on right now? Basically, do you think that they'll ever get the axe or is it similarly just sort of, and no one's going to get that felony charge, but, you know, hopefully they'll get fucked. Uh, what depends, do you think? Depends how op, good how their OPSEC was. That is what it comes down to. But this is being treated as a major, major investigation by the White House. So, I hope they're I hope they're using burner cell phones and signal and doing dead drops and everything else because if there was one one breach in OPSEC on this and Tor is not as secure as people think it is, I'll tell you that right now. Tor is not as secure as people think it is. So if, if they were if their OPSEC wasn't on point, and I'm talking like dead drops, and I'm not gonna go into spy crap because that's how I get my stories. I don't get my biggest stories through phones and everything else we do, you know. Real, real, you know, trade crap kind of stuff. So, I don't know, man. We'll see. But I do know that it's being treated as a big investigation. Thanks for your call. All right, man. Thank you for the insight. Have a good one. Man, it's crazy. Yeah. So that's the thing, man. I hate to tell you guys, but I don't, I don't think Seth Rich is ever going to really have justice. I think that they're just going to have 
some patsy, take the charge. That's because that's how I do it. If you're on YouTube, hit the like button. So if you're on if you're on YouTube, hit the like button and be sure to subscribe to want to get a lot of subscribers. We've been growing our YouTube. Initially, we, we thought we would do 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year. But then I started doing more work with Alex Jones. So when I'm doing a lot of stuff with Alex Jones, I don't have as much time to build my profile up as I did on YouTube. So definitely subscribe to the YouTube, hit the like button, and we're growing. So what do we have right now? My YouTube is, yeah, I mean, we're almost 44,000 subscribers. We're gaining 1,500 subscribers a week. So we're, we're trucking along. We're definitely, you know, we're definitely moving, moving along, moving nicely, but we're not moving as quickly as if I weren't doing, you know, stuff with other people. But, hey, that's just the way it is. Las Vegas, Nevada, how you doing? Hey, Mike. Good, good to talk to you again. Always a pleasure. Hey, uh, I was wondering real quick, I wanted to see if we would update on your rally, uh, if you've got anything organized. And also, I wanted to tell people, keep people energized, man. Even though Trump may be messing up or we don't know exactly what's going on, Trump base does not disappear. Go out, post an event on Facebook. You know, even if it's just you and another guy having beer shooting the bull. They they work you know, they work and uh, keep, keep meeting with people. Gotcha. Okay, so the so he's kind of wondering like what, how are MAGA meetups? Um, you know, what's MAGA meetups and how is that going and kind of all that stuff and the answer is they're happening now in D.C. By the way, Laura, thanks. Laura says not only is Seth Rich dead, but so is Gavin McFadden, the American reporter and WikiLeaks director who Seth Rich sent 45000 Yeah, so a lot of funny things happened. You know, and life coincidences happen. But Seth Rich dying is a little bit too convenient. Yeah, so MAGA meetups, they are happening in, they are happening in Washington, D.C. for sure already. And they're, they're happening all over. And people are doing them themselves. I kind of I launched the project and I set it up and then I just moved away from everything because I just want it to be grassroots and organic and that is um so that's where it is it's wherever people want to take it so there's a hashtag M A G A M E E T U P S MAGA meetups some people post MAGA meetup singular so check them both check both the hashtags post the hashtag if you want to find an event near you, go there. And if you want to start one, just say, "Hey, I want to, I want to start one in, you know, and and wherever you are." So, what do we got going on here? We got a message from somebody. Who's this? Oh wow! So a bunch of info on, you know, Seth Rich and other stuff. A lot of crazy things going on. So here's some weird coincidences that happened. Just before the murder. Oh wow! So there were lights missing with picks. Oh wow! So it seems like before Seth Rich died, there may have been some um, street lights taken down. But again, that's the kind of stuff that a competent investigator would uncover. Is it looks like um, maybe lights were taken down near the area to make the hit easier. I don't know. I haven't confirmed it myself, but I'm just saying. A lot of weird things, a lot of weird things have been happening, and the D.C. police, they don't care about it. October event. The big event is happening in October. Maybe I can call, hold on, let me see if I can call, let me see if I can call my uh, event co-organizer. Um, oh, wait, I think he's busy. Hold on. So I, um, yeah, so the big event I'm planning with the, my Deplorable co-organizer, we're calling it the big event because we're not going to launch the name and the, the website or anything yet until, you know, we're on point. And hold on. So let me see if I can. Okay, so hold on. I'm going to see. Can you talk on my live stream about the big event? All right, so hopefully I can get my... You know, we can just talk about it right now. You know, where is, where is it going? You know, what is going on? So that would be the best, that would be the best place to talk about that right now. So hold on, I'm going to go, okay, so I'm going to call him. I'm going to try to call him. Let me see, can I call just like this? I can. 
Come on, there we go. Whoa, magic. All right. Hey. Hola. Hola, how are you? Good, good. Trying to get you on the, the Bluetooth here, so let me see if I... All right, mic check. Hey. Okay, good. So, yeah, for whatever reason, it won't let me have this audio on the Bluetooth. That's interesting. Anyway, people had a, um, you know, they wanted to hear about the big event and what we were thinking and what we had going on. So I figured who better to, to pipeline in than you. Yeah. So are we live now, Mike? Yeah, we're live. Yeah, so just to paint the picture a little bit. So, you know, as you know, we've collaborated on a number of different events in the past. There's just a huge desire, I think, for community and continued momentum in what we're doing in this movement. And so Mike and I thought, well, what would it take to the next level? Right. And I'm hearing an echo. No, you're, you're good now. I had to cut you out. So you're on my Bluetooth, the big, the better speaker now. Oh, cool. Okay. No, no I still hear my voice. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Okay, try one more time. Let me, let me turn it down. Okay, try now. Uh, testing, one, two, three. Yeah, I, I still hear my annoying voice. Okay, so I will just take you off the Bluetooth then. Okay, sorry guys. So this, I need a producer, guys. If you want me to have a producer full time, then now you know how to. So did we lose the call? I think we dropped the call. We're trying again. All right, so we're about to talk about the big event. No, no, no. I'm, I'm reconnecting. I got this. Hey. All right, you're back. All right, so you were painting the picture th for the event. People want more community, more cool yeah, things. So we were t yeah, so, so we were talking about, you know, we were talking about what would it look like to take this to the next level. And I think a lot of us want to really build a future on the right, for lack of a better word, just take it over. And, uh, and so we thought, like, what, what would – what could we build that would actually compete with CPAC and replace it? And so that's that's kind of what came out of the conversation was this two, two and a half kind of day, weekend event, probably in the late fall, 1,000 to 1,500 people. We're talking big. A uh, number of keynotes, like starting to get some really amazing people involved, a couple of different tracks so people could get, get some hands-on like training um, as well as, you know, more intellectual you know, tracks on a variety of different topics, not just all politics all the time, but, you know, broader for the movement and really just bring together for a fabulous time and, and weekend event. Um, so, you know, Mike, you know, we're still in the conceptual phase of this. I actually have a call after this with an event management group uh, here in Washington that's helping us identify venues and will help us plan the event. So we're, yeah, we're planning to go big. We're planning to go professional and um, hoping to make this happen. Um, uh, but well, I think we'll know more in the next week. Yeah. So, what, you know, what Jeff is saying, by the way, we did the deplorable together. Is we want to do, we got to take over the right, but we don't want another boring kind of basic, um, you know, political action thing. We want an intellectual event where all kinds of different people would want to come talk. And we're, so we're conceptualizing it. So the, we're coming up with a different name. A different setup and one thing that we thought would be cool is to have short TEDx style talks so we know that a lot of you are amazing people we would want um, people who watch us and listen to be able to audition then we would want to have more established people not just leaders in politics but also leaders in business tech everywhere else so we were kind of thinking of 12 minute talks isn't that right yeah, that's part of it. I mean, I think it's sort of like an unconference, so a little bit of South, more South by Southwest, you know, for the political arena in our movement. Um, so I think that'll start to come together. It just, it just depends on the different pieces and, and, and what people want. And what's great about you, Mike, and your community is you're so great at getting feedback from people in real time. So 
I think what's, what will be awesome about this conference is we really want to involve the community in helping planning, really helping shape it to, to fit the needs of the, of the community and what, what, what's going to help us make it awesome and, and keep as much momentum as possible. Right. And so we were talking about even breakout sessions where people could learn how to do social media, guest lectures, better music. I think that's another thing for those of you listening that we talked about is we want more energy, more music. CPAC is just very boring, very stated. We want something fresh. We also talked about an art show, but that might be a standalone event or it might be in conjunction with this. So we got a lot going on, yeah. huh? Yeah. I mean, just to kind of paint the picture, at least in my mind, of what it's looking like you know, as we're spreadsheeting it out and everything. So you arrive on Friday, you register, it's at a hotel, probably in the DC area. Uh, you register, and then that Friday night, there's like kind of a keynote, and like a kind of a, a reception, a party Friday night. Then Saturday, and by the way, it'd probably be cash bar, because we want to keep ticket prices as low as possible to get as many people there as possible. We'll have different tiers and stuff to help people who want to sub help subsidize the event. Then Saturday, You'll wake up, there'll be, you know, coffee and then probably a keynote or something, maybe a couple breakout sessions. There might be a track where you can get trained on how to do video stuff by somebody who's great at that or, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then there'll be kind of a conference for the day. And then that night we'll probably have a dinner. And that dinner will be for people who pay extra, who, who agree to help subsidize the event. Um, and then everybody else can like, you know, we want to create a lot of space for people to just connect and be able to do their own things. And so we don't want to over-program it. Um, and then Sunday would be, you know, another half day and three quarters day of, of conference type stuff. So, you know, a real objective is to keep prices low because it's expensive to travel to Washington and stay in a hotel and, and do all that. So we want to keep the prices low so that as many people can come to this as possible. We'll, we'll have a student rate. We'll have a general admissions rate. And then we'll also have rates for people who want to help make the event possible. So we'll probably have a contributor, you know, track for, and then also uh, uh, a host committee like we did for the deplorable. And then we also, you know, there are a lot of people out there, Mike, who want this event to happen. They want the movement to keep moving forward, but maybe they can't attend. So we also want to create a way for them to, you know, help contribute and, and make the event possible. So, you know, maybe we'll sell T-shirts or something in exchange for contributions for that kind of thing. Um, or kind of yeah, that out. or maybe a live. We could live stream and sell live stream passes. But yeah, so Jeff talked on pricing, which is I'll tell you sort of my philosophy on this, and a lot of people have said this is we want to do tiered pricing. So we want to have we want to have a ticket price so that anybody who can save up you know, can be able to afford the ticket price. And then we're going to have bigger tiers where there's a lot of people who, you know, are able to step up in a bigger way, and then we'll have opportunities and perks and benefits available for those who are kind of really able to step up. And then we did want to do the live streaming for people who, who can't make it too. But I, um, so the pricing thing is very important because we don't want anybody to not be able to afford it. Now, granted, we, you know, if you make it free, people don't appreciate it. But it was kind of like the deplorable. The deplorable tickets were there were a lot of people who were able to put up twenty five hundred, and a lot of people who were able to put up five thousand to sponsor it. And then the ticket prices we kept at like one hundred fifty dollars or something like that. So we made it so that people could they could afford a general ticket, but then people who you know are in a better position in life and really want to step up, then they're able to step up too. And so that'll be our thinking on pricing is one affordable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just so you guys know, I mean, I think Mike, we're pretty transparent about this. I mean, currently we're looking at a budget of $300,000. Yeah. So it's, it's not cheap. And Mike and I are putting our necks on the line to, to finance it. Um, so yeah, so we're going big with this one. And, and I think one, one thing Mike, I'm really excited about is a lot of people are asking, you know, where is this movement going? Well, you know, what, what is, what do you guys actually stand for? Um, you know, and I, th I think this event kind of like the deplorable was a, a forward momentum for, for this movement. I think this event will also give us an opportunity to start putting stakes in the ground and identifying, you know, what do we stand for? And, you know, how are we different from the CPAC type Republicans? And, 
you know, what are, what are some common principles that, that are non-negotiables for us? And then what are things we can agree to disagree about? So just as an example, like two common principles I see in this movement are, you know, number one, a commitment to sovereignty. Like we want rule of law in terms of enforced immigration policy and a smart immigration policy and just a sense of sovereignty and no amnesty. And then second is speech. You know, we really care about free speech and so forth. So I think starting to build that core set of principles of what, what we all stand for, what we want to stand for going forward is a huge, huge opportunity for us. So I'm really excited about, about that and kind of bringing the community together to, to hammer that out. Yeah, because exactly. So you mentioned price. I'll just say yeah, I'll tell you the truth, which is that we wanted to have an event in June and we had a hundred thousand dollar budget. And you know, Jeff and I, of course, put up all the money. And then the people go, nah, you know, you can either have a so so event for a hundred grand, or you can do it right, but to do it right is gonna cost three hundred thousand dollars. And we go, okay, then so you can't just on two months' notice have a three hundred thousand dollar event. That's why we were thinking October, you know, maybe Halloween weekend, and that would give us enough time to plan it. Because when we're the ones signing the contracts and everything, it's, it's easy for people yeah. to say, why don't we have more events? Well, you know, we have to come up with the 300 grand. And, and even that is a short timeline. In the event world, for events this size, you know, people plan them like a year out. And so, you know, that's not really our style. We're like, let's just get it done. And so even this amount of time, even doing it in October, is, is pretty rushed. Right. Um, so, I mean, I definitely want to do that. The event people were like, you know, hey, we might be able to get a better rate. Like if we, you know, the Trump Hotel is too expensive for this, but if you pushed it out to January, right. we might be able to get a better rate that makes it possible. And, um, and I'm like, I don't know if it's worth pushing it out to January. I think we, we have a bias towards getting it you know, getting this done and, and, and getting this shot on goal. That's how I think of it. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, we, we had a budget for October, and then they said, well, you can do it in January. And see, the thing is, we don't like that this new movement, the, the new right, whatever it's called, we don't like that we're defined by what we're not. And the big vision for the big event is we're going to define ourselves by what we are versus what we're not. And that's the challenge. Can you be – a nationalist? Can you be a populist without hating people? What you know, What does that even mean? And of course you can, and we all know you can, but we want the real thinkers, the original thinkers. And we also want to get people to talk about memetic warfare, fourth generation warfare, the, the real terrorist threats in America, the kind of conversations you're not going to have at a boring, um, you know, CPAC kind of event, real intellectuals, and then another thing we wanted to do, and we'll see if we can do it, but, you know, Jeff had this great thing where you call it, um, what did you call, you You have dinner with your, I don't want to call them enemies, but maybe tell them about having dinner with Hillary supporters and then how we might translate that to an event at our big event. Yeah, I mean, I think the possibilities are endless. And, I mean, what I love about, what I love about, you know, this community is we want to make community driven and like you guys can be a part of helping us shape and create this event. I mean, obviously we're just going to plow forward and get it done, but, but we really value your input of stuff and we've got to keep it simple. We can't do everything in the world. We're not going to be able to take every single point of input seriously, but, uh, but we really value your, your feedback and input and, want you guys involved in, in in designing the event. I mean, even the brand of the event, Mike and I are kind of going back and forth and stuff like that. So it, it'll be fun as we, once we identify, the first step is, the next step, and I'm going to have to get off this call within five, ten minutes to get on another call for this very reason, but the first step for us is to identify the venue and sign the contract with the venue and once we do that, we'll have a date, and then everything will start to flow from that. We'll be able to share with you guys when this thing's taking place and where it's taking place, so you can start your travel planning, hopefully. Right, um, so exactly. That was, um, that's the next step, yeah. Yeah, and, one of the, and, and kind of like one of the things I was talking about is, so Jeff did this NPR thing or whatever where it was the idea of like having dinner with people you don't agree with, and our spin on that was kind of be – what if we had a panel, and I don't know if he'll do it or not, but 
you know, what if we had a panel where you have somebody like Sam Altman, who's very liberal, but who has been trying to understand the Trump movement, we could have maybe a round table of how do you talk to people that you disagree with politically without losing your mind or hating people or anything? I, and I think that would be a cool panel too because we don't want to just get the most diehard Trump people. We want to get people who are willing to talk and have open and civil conversation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we're thinking past the sale, you know, and that's one of your principles, Mike. And we're thinking about it past the sale. We're going legit. We yeah. are the new establishment. And that's going to be our attitude going into this event. And we don't want to lose our edge and our punch. We still want to stand for something strong. And yet at the same time, we also, we're, we're, we're going to edge in the new mainstream. Like this is going to become the next CPAC, but not lame. <laughs> right, exactly. So the people that we support, that'll be the news. And that is the thing is that the deplorable, so this, for those of you who want to learn how to think strategic about, strategically about your own life, Jeff and I did the deplorable to show people that was like our coming out party. That was our way of saying, can you bring people from Twitter to real life, right? Are people who are just on Twitter, are they going to show up in real life? And that event sold out so quick. If we had known how it was going to sell out, we just sold 5,000 tickets. You know, we, we had no idea. We sold out 1,000 in like 36 hours or something. So this event is going to say not only are we here and we're not going anywhere, and there is no difference between Twitter and social media and real media. People are going to show up. But now we are the leaders of the GOP, and it's part of our plan to take over the GOP. That's how we're thinking. That's how big we're thinking. And, yeah, I'll share a little bit of a secret. So um, so CPAC is owned, whatever, by the American Conservative Union. I think that's what it's called. It's some, you know, some, like, nonprofit, fancy-sounding organization. Well, you know, I'm having a kid coming out here, and I'm probably going to be starting a new think tank or slash, you know, institute. And Mike, I know you're not into that stuff, and that's cool. We differ in that way. Um, but yeah, it could also be hosted by Cernovich Media along with the, the America First Council or some new institute, think tank, research institute like that, that, that starts to institutionalize what we're doing. And I know a lot of us like shudder at the words, you know, institutionalize or think tank. They sound like kind of lame. Um, but I, I will say that's kind of what this movement needs, needs to start to think about. I mean, you saw this, Mike, during the transition period uh, with Trump's transition. You know, there was no people or policy ecosystem in Washington. I live in Washington. There's no people or policy ecosystem for Trump-style politics at all. That's right. why heritage dominated the process. And that's why we have all these, right. you know, cucks in the White House and all these never Trumpers, you know, in the White House. We didn't have that, that, that bench, those people ready to go and those ideas and stuff like that. So, you know, it's kind of boring work in a way, but we, we need to start thinking in terms of the next 10 years and how can we institutionalize and start to build, you know, an enduring presence. Right. Yes. Yeah. We need it. We need to deepen our talent pool, and this is how we do it. All right. I know you're busy, so thanks a lot for calling in, yeah. Jeff. And we'll, hey, when, thanks for having me on. When we have more details, we'll let people know. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Great. Bye. Right. So we need we need to expand our talent pool. We need to get you know we got a lot of things going on. So you know I'm expanding in media. We need a think tank that actually is pro America. So there's a lot going on, and this is kind of like the vision we're having. Anyhow, thanks for watching. If you're on Periscope, tap the screen. Da, 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 da. Give me them likes. We're trying to get 20 million likes. We're, we're almost at we're almost at 20 million likes on Periscope. Let me check it. If you're on YouTube, hit the like button and hit the subscribe button. If you super chatted me, thank you. Here, let me see if you super. Oh, we got a couple super chats. Thank you for the super chats, everybody. Uh, much appreciated. We're, you know, we're closing in on 20 million likes. We're, we're expanding everywhere. And then the big event in October, wow. We're going to blow some minds with the big event in October. That is our goal, and that's why it's going to cost 300 grand. A lot of people go, 300 grand for a shindig? You've obviously never planned a big event. It's, there's a lot going on to it. So thanks for watching. Thanks for support. I'll talk to you all soon. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube. Thank you, everybody.